we thank you that you are here. We thank you that your word is living and active. Your word is truth. We need truth today. If there is one thing that we need today, we need truth. So we tune out all the other voices right now and we just listen to your word. Lord, we ask that you would speak to us in your wonderful and glorious name. Amen. This morning, if you've made your way to Luke 14, we're going to pick it up in verse 15 in a moment. Uh, The first job I ever had was working in radiators, fixing car radiators, and my first boss was uh, an interesting gentleman, to say the least, but he was was like 80 years old when I started, Um, so that was, you know, only two or three years ago. But uh, I worked for him for about eight or nine years, and, you know, Trevor was a... Uh, We had an enormous property um, right in the middle of town. I mean, he had the location for a business. Uh, He had made his wealth uh, when he was the only radiator shop for many years, and there was great markups in radiators, and uh, it's a dying industry now. But uh, Trevor was an interesting guy. Uh, We had an enormous property, huge workshop, many offshoots and and sheds, but Trevor had a problem. And And I know I'm preaching to some of the... I know there's people here whose hearts are going to be open. Uh, Trevor wouldn't throw anything out. There's some people, in, there's some people here today that started looking sideways when I said that. Uh, Trevor had an enormous amount of what most of us considered to be rubbish. I remember one day uh, we had a storm in Launceston and he, he was away as he was in January and uh, his daughters, two of his daughters worked f- with us, and one of them had a brand new BMW. Who'd buy a BMW, right? That's right, go and buy a Holden Captiva if you really want to be blessed. But, <laughs> but she had a brand new BMW and she parked in the same spot she always did, and the storm actually blew something loose. And where she used to park, there was, for want of a better term, just nothing but a pile of rubbish hidden behind one of the buildings in the laneway, and it all blew over onto her car. Oh. oh. Hell hath no fury like Mr. Eichen's daughter when her BMW has been damaged. She's immediately on the phone, which is a challenge in itself because Trevor was deaf in one ear and couldn't hear out the other. (laughs) She's immediately on the phone and she says to Trevor, she says, that rubbish you've got up the side has blown onto my car. And the minute I heard her raise her voice, I I went to the back of the workshop. (laughs) I thought I'm going to let this one play out. And she walked out and she said, I can't believe his response. I'm thinking, oh, hello. And she said, you know what he said to me? And I'm thinking, the mind boggles. (laughs) She said, his first comment to me was, what rubbish are you talking about? (laughs) You see, what we perceive to be rubbish uh, had value in the eyes of Trevor. We live in a society and a community today that Jesus is like rubbish. We're going to use his name like a swear word whenever we feel like it. We we do it in movies now. It's acceptable. It's acceptable to use the name of the God-man in an offensive manner in Hollywood. Most people think Jesus was not even a historical figure. And there's a trap that we as believers and we as churches often fall into if we are not careful. And that is the trap that we think that our job is to make Jesus more attractive. We've got to, we've got to dress everything up. And it's, it's, it's all going to be about making... We've, we've got to make the gospel more appealing to people. We've got to tell people that if they come to Jesus, their life is going to be rosy and everything's going to be okay. <laughs> if you were sold that gospel, go and get your money back. Jesus didn't promise that to anybody. Jesus, not even in the fine print, Jesus made it clear, if you're going to follow me, you need to take up your cross. Uh, Our number one job, friends, and task, I believe, is not to make Jesus more attractive because I can't make Jesus more attractive. It's for us to fall in love with him. If we want the world to value Jesus more, they need to see it in us. Jesus told a wonderful parable, if you've met me in Luke chapter 14, and when Jesus tells parables, he's using something that is physical and well known to us to convey a very deep and spiritual truth. And when we are attempting to uh, interpret parables, we have to be careful. The interpretation 
is normally either given to us, Jesus will say this is the interpretation of the parable, or the interpretation lies in a question or conversation that precedes the parable or comes afterwards. This time it precedes. What Jesus has to say in this parable precedes a comment that comes in verse 15. Verse 15, when one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat. Underline those two words, will eat. Bread in the kingdom of God. And Jesus decides that he's going to answer that comment. You're tracking with me? Jesus begins... Now, there's a disclaimer I need to put forward. Everything we now read, your Bible should have in red letters. So everything I now say from this point onwards, if you've got a problem with it, take it up with the man that said it. Because this parable was aimed more at the religious people of the day than it was non-believers. And sometimes we get that flipped around. Let's read. A man once gave a great banquet... And this is the parable of the great banquet. It parallels the uh, uh, one in Matthew 22 about the wedding feast, but there's it, close parallels. But this is different on so many levels. And this is the, uh, the parable of the great banquet. This banquet is great for two main reasons. The amount of people that were invited, but more importantly, something I think we have lost as the church of Jesus Christ. More importantly, it's great because of the one who penned the invitation. This banquet is great because of the one who sets the table, the one who sends the invitations, and the one who will give a call. This is a, this is a great banquet. Now, today, we like to eat food, and we like to get together and have food. But who knows that when we get together for a meal... Don't need Daryl. It's okay. Who knows that when we get together for a meal, the food is not the point unless you're going to Charlotte's place, then the food is, ab- <laughs> then, then the food is absolutely the point. <laughs> Charlotte's spiritual gift is cooking. No, it's not. It's one of. Now, what are you saying when you invite somebody for a meal? Nobody sits there in silence. Uh, what you're actually saying to that person is, I would like you to separate in your scheduled time to come into my presence, and I would like to spend time in your presence. What you're saying when you hold a banquet, and what you were saying in the first century when you held a banquet like this was, I want you in my presence. When invitations for banquets like this went out, they were well received. This is like like the queen penning an invitation, and all of us saying, no thanks. But a man once gave a great banquet and he invited many. An invitation he has invited many. In the first century, whenever a banquet was held, something that's very important was that an invitation would go out first. So well in advance of the banquet, they would, they would send out an invitation. It's kind of like when everybody comes home after, after work and after school, there's, there's kind of two, there's an invitation and a call you could say. It's like, what's for tea? Okay, we're going we're gonna to have tea at 6 p.m. and we're going to have this. And then later on, there's a call that sounds a little bit like, hey, y'all, the food's ready. In the first century, there was always an invitation. It went out well before the banquet to announce that you were requested to join somebody in their presence and to dine with them. Then there was a call and the call was, the food's ready. The call was, the banquet's ready. The call was, the host is ready. The call, as we will see, is now. You see, a man once gave a great banquet, said Jesus, and invited many, and at the time for the banquet. Hold with him for a moment. He sent his servant to say to those who had been invited. Somebody's been invited. Uh, Every parable Whenever there's characters in the parable, they have a direct relation to somebody else. The man, of course, is God. The servants, in this respect, are the people of God or the the prophets. And those that were invited are the people of Israel. The invitation 
for some five to six hundred years had been going out through the prophets. There will be a new covenant, says the Lord. No longer, I love, I love the words in Jeremiah. There's going to be a new covenant. Things are going to be different. There's going to be a new banquet. The food's going to be completely different. No longer will one man say to his neighbor, thus says the Lord, for you shall all know me, says God. That's the new covenant. I will write my laws on your mind and on your heart. We go to Ezekiel where God promises to take away our heart of stone and give us a, a new heart, a pliable heart. And for many years, the invitation had gone out. For many years, God had invited his people into his presence. And now, what is Jesus saying? Well, let's see what Jesus has to say. What is the message? What is the thrust of this parable? And the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. Please underline that word now. Too often, we make the mistake of thinking that everything is in the future. I've just got to suffer my way through to heaven, and, and when I get to heaven, all will be revealed, and I can enjoy the presence of God when I get into heaven. And all of those things are correct, yes, but the banquet is now. That is the message that is for us, and that is the message for a world that doesn't know God, is he has set the table, and the banquet is now. We're not inviting people now, we're calling them. Calling them to a banquet and calling them to come and enjoy the presence of God. The message is come, for now everything is ready. Why? Because Jesus was right there before them. Everything's ready. The new covenant's about to be ushered. Hmm. But there was a problem. Verse... 18, but they, all alike, began to make excuses. Friends, I spent five years working for the forestry, and I, I want to give everybody in this place a heads up. In those five years, I can guarantee you I've heard every excuse. You see, the guys that worked for me, they... Some of them had some pretty sound excuses, like, um, I'm in jail for the next three months. Um, that's a pretty airtight alibi. And I don't have a chopper to get you out, so you'll have to miss work for three months. But, I mean, I had guys whose grandma died three times. <laughs> I, I've heard all the excuses, right? And this word excuse in the Greek means exactly what it means today. It means to seek a release from an obligation due to a self-interest. But what are we really saying when we make excuses? We, we kind of flippantly make excuses all the time. And I was just thinking about this this week, because what are these guys really telling me? I was clear with these guys when I put them on in the forestry. Uh, you might get paid for what you do, and no, you don't get paid when you don't turn up, but I need 20 guys here every day. Otherwise, I'll go and find somebody else that's going to turn up. I mean, I've got plenty of work for you guys. You're in the top dollar. I need you here every day. Uh, I heard... <laughs> Uh, I've had guys ring me with the pub in the background. I won't be able to make it tomorrow. And the, you know, the doof, doof. And the, yeah. <laughs> what they're really telling me is this. Something else has a higher priority than you. And I don't really want to tell you this, so I'm going to make up an excuse. In the first century, if you were invited to a banquet and you said yes, which is what has happened here, and then you didn't turn up, that's the most offensive thing you could do. Let's have a listen to some of the excuses. I wonder, I wonder whether we still make excuses today. I was thinking about this this week. And the Lord put, some, put his finger on some things in my heart. I say tomorrow or tomorrow. You know, the enemy, you can make all of the grand plans you like. I, you, you, can, you can make plans to go deeper with God and all those things. As long as you keep saying tomorrow, the enemy doesn't care. The minute you pick up your Bible, turn the television off and walk into the prayer closet, you've just found yourself an enemy. But while we keep making excuses... God's presence 
goes waiting. God's waiting for us. One thing you need to know about the great banquet, God has set the table, God has called each person in this room to this table, God has called every single person. Yes, it's a global, universal invitation, but if you're a person of God here, he has, he has called you to fill yourself spiritually nowhere else. And one thing you need to know is there are no Uber Eats in the kingdom of God. You, he's not bringing it to you, you've got to make some effort here. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first guy said, I have bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. Okay, so you buy a field sight unseen, foolish, and I can't make it to your banquet, which is at a night time, because I need to go and see my field in the daytime. Okay, maybe the next guy's got a better excuse. The first said to him, I've bought a field and I must go out and see it, please have me excused. And then another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Another clown. I'm going to buy five yoke of oxen and I haven't even seen them. Okay. The third guy might just get away with it. I know you've read in front of me, Terry. <laughs> and another said, I got married. Yep, you're off the hook, dude. It's okay. <laughs> that's, that's not the case because um, if this was a real excuse, I have a mar- I have a, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. If that was a real excuse, uh, if he had a wife, your wife is invited as well. And I really want to push this point home because as the church of Jesus Christ, we need to drop our excuses because... There's something coming for those that are invited. We haven't got to the end of the parable yet. Often, we have a... We have this kind of image of Jesus, this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus with his hair flowing in the wind, kind of... Revelations paints a picture of Jesus with a tattoo down his leg. King of kings and Lord of lords. When John, who walked the earth with this Jesus for three years, when John heard a voice behind him in the book of Revelations, he says, I fell down like a dead man. Note, please, we'll fight about the detail of Revelation later, but note one thing, Jesus came riding on a horse and he had a sword in his hand. More about that next week. And another said, I've married a wife and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry. A.W. Tozer says that every single one of us is as close to God as we want to be. Every single one of us dines at this table as often as we want to dine there. The question I ask everybody this morning is, are you dining at the great banquet? Have you got excuses? I wonder whether the excuses have stopped. I'd love to... How many times have we heard this? I'd love to go deeper with God, but, you know, I I just haven't got the time. I'm going to let you in on a secret. You're never going to have the time. You're going to have to make the time. It's all about what we prioritise. You see... God bless his cotton socks. Trevor, he kind of rubbed off on me over about eight or nine years. I I can remember doing a a vintage radiator. And in uh, vintage radiators, you can't get parts for them anymore. 1920s cars, you can't get parts for them anymore. And and I said, listen, I've got a problem, Trevor. I said, "Uh, these fittings, I needed two fittings for this radiator. And I said, I can't find anything anywhere. I said, I can't even find anything close. I said, it's got to be original or close to original. You know what these guys are like. And he said, hang on a second. 15 minutes later, he comes out with a bucket, big plastic bucket, puts it up on the bench and he says, have a look through there. I think, I think there was a couple of fittings that Noah had. <laughs> the two fittings I wanted were in there. I started to get an appreciation for some of his junk. 
what he would call junk. I started, and maybe the world, if we, maybe if we stopped our excuses, maybe if we stopped uh, having all the same pursuits as everybody else, maybe if we stopped having the same language and lingo as everybody else, maybe if we loved Jesus to our nth degree, maybe this world would begin to value him a little bit more too. What they are saying when they make excuses is they are displaying an absolute disposition for the host. At the back of every excuse is a lack of desire. We desire far too many things apart from God. We allow our calendar to be consumed with far too many things apart from God. When Jesus was writing to the Ephesian church who had lost their first love, he gave them a remedy. When he was writing to a church who was doing great things, he was writing to the Ephesians and he he outlays their accolades. I see your works, I see your deeds. But you've lost your first love. What does he say to them? What does he tell them to do? Do the former works. What's Jesus saying? When you were first born again, they couldn't keep you out of church. When you were first born again, you had your... Bible in your back pocket when you're at work. When you were first born again, you were at every prayer meeting, you were at every life group. He says, but now half the time you're at the beach. Bring it home to pastors. Now half the time you're out fishing. And God sits waiting at the table. He hears all the excuses. And the table has been set and Jesus says, I am the bread of life. (laughs) What else do we want to taste? Another said, I have married a wife. Please pray for this guy. And therefore I cannot come. Verse 21, so the servant came and reported these things to his master. The master of the house became angry. He said to his servant, go out quickly, underline the word quickly, go out quickly to the streets. Now, there's a difference in the language, and Jesus is very deliberate in the language now. We've sent out the invitations, they all said yes, but no one's coming to the table. So what does the master do? The master says, I will have my table full, so go out. Go out quickly. Why quickly? What is the urgency here? The table's set. The lamb roast is getting cold. If you're invited to Charlotte's, be there early. You taste the food with your nose. Go out quickly to the streets, the lanes of the city, and I love this. First time we're saying come, first time it's an invitation. And for those that were here last week, go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in. Now the language is a little bit different. Bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. I love Jesus for this. Why? Because the gospel does not recognize social class. The gospel is actually not interested in your rap sheet. Jesus, (laughs) I remember when I was in the forestry, I worked with a lot of guys that were in and out of jail. They couldn't get jobs anywhere else, but they were good workers. They were good guys to have, and they, 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 they would do as I told them. If anybody else tried to do them something, I'd, uh, and th- these guys had their own moral code. You know, it's kind of like we hold the world to our moral code. But yeah. every time they'd start, I, I never interviewed any of them. I used to get a phone call from a guy that I was working with, and he'd say, I've got another one coming out. You got in your room? I'd go, yeah, mate, no worries. Tell him to be at the car park at 6 o'clock. And... The first thing they would say to me is, G'day, my name's such and such, and I was in for it. I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, I don't care what you do after six o'clock. And I said, I don't care what you did yesterday. I said, but between six and six, I said, you're mine. I said, I care what you do between those hours. I don't know. I don't care what you were in for. I don't care what you did. I care whether you're going to turn up to work. And so many of us come to Jesus and go, "Uh, yeah, hi, my name's such and such, and you don't know what I've done. And Jesus goes, I don't care what you've done. 
We all fall in the same bracket. This is uh, the gospel breaks down all the walls of social class, all the walls of race. Black lives matter, absolutely. But so do the white ones and so do all the other colours. The gospel says that everybody matters and we had that well before they were marching down the streets of America. Go out quickly and bring in the lame, the poor and the crippled. Why do we have to bring them in? Because they're going to need some help. They can't see. They have no knowledge of God. They're infirm spiritually as well as physically. You're going to have to give them a hand. But I love the last one. Let's move quickly to the last one. Verse 22, and the servant said, so what you commanded has been done and still there is room. What does the servant not say? The servant this time didn't say they made up excuses. Isn't that interesting? We go out to the lame, the blind. Grace hits the infirm and those that are at rock bottom. And these guys are like, I'm there. Best meal I've had in ages. Whenever somebody walks into, and I brag about you guys everywhere I go, but when people walk through them doors, the first thing that should smack them in the face, apart from coffee, is grace and love. And resoundingly, that's the testimony I hear from people that have been here and are here now. And the servant said, so what you commanded has been done and still there is room. God won't have any seat empty. Verse 23, the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in. Underline that word compel. That's, That's an awesome word. Go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. The highways and the hedges in the first century, if it wasn't bad enough that the gospel, this invitation now, it doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing, uh, but you have to be wearing them, by the way, if you come to church. That's a prerequisite. (laughs) You can wear whatever clothes you like to church, but you must be wearing clothes. It doesn't matter what clothes you're wearing, doesn't matter whether you're blind, doesn't matter whether you're, uh, whatever infirmity you have, paralysed, we will carry you if you were here last week. But the highways and the hedges were reserved for the squatters and the tramps. The highways and the hedges was a term that was reserved for the prostitutes. It was a man on the slums of India that made an impact amongst a community. He was a missionary that had preached the gospel in the slums of India for some time without a whole lot to do. And he's kind of praying about, God, what can I do? One night, he's walking through the streets and he sees two men walk out with a lady, open up a bin, throw a body in. This is what they did with prostitutes when they'd passed away. But, you know, this isn't right. So what he began to do was, he began to take these ladies and he would take them to a place and he would hold a service and he would give them a very dignified funeral. He did this for many, many months. And finally... Some of these ladies came out of the building and they said, we've been seeing what you've been doing. Why do you do that? And he says, well, I I have my faith in a man by the name of Jesus Christ. And Jesus happens to think that everybody matters. And everybody should get a proper funeral. And by a small, what seems like insignificant act, he compelled those ladies come to faith in Jesus Christ. When they saw the love, how do we compel people to come to Jesus? There's many ways. John Maxwell says, beautifully, John Maxwell says, you know what? Nobody cares what you know until they know how much you care. We must preach the gospel We must tell people about the truth of Jesus. But we must also live the gospel because that's what compels people to come to Jesus. 
Jesus was a man that compelled everybody around him. This word compel, uh, in the Greek, it speaks about placing pressure upon. It's, it's about placing pressure upon to persuade somebody. I want to question everybody here this morning. How much does your life pressurize those that are around you? If you're here on a Tuesday, there's an enormous amount of pressure that comes from the office. But I began to ask myself, what does it look like to compel people? What does it look like to live the kind of life that compels people? The question I want to ask, and I've asked this many times, are you a thermostat or a thermometer? Because thermostats set the temperature of the room. And it has been far too long that the church has read the temperature of its culture. The church has read the temperature of the community around them. The church has allowed the government and everybody else to tell us who we are, what we should say, when we can speak what we should do with our Sundays, what we should do with our middle weeks, why we should hold the other things in priority. We have allowed everybody else to set our temperature. I love uh, the testimony of a pastor that graduated from C.H. Spurgeon's School of Pastors. On his graduating day, he walks up to Charles Spurgeon and says, I've enjoyed my time here, sir. What's the one bit of advice you have for me as I enter my pastorate? These words I will carry with me for the rest of my life. Charles Spurgeon looked at this man and he said, Son, he said, set yourself on fire. He said, and the world will come and watch you burn. Go and set yourself on fire and the world will watch you burn. When you walk into a room, do you change the temperature in that room? Does the life that you live place pressure on other people? We've allowed pressure to go the other way for far too long. Pastors and leadership are not exempt from this. Living a life that is compelling, living a life that is a thermostat kind of a life, looks like living a life without excuses. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the banquet ready. Now is the table set. Now you can enjoy the presence of God. If you've never tasted of Jesus, today's your day of salvation. The number one thing the world is waiting for in our Reaching Out series we are speaking about impacting earth with the power of heaven. Living lives that are compelling looks like, it's very, very simple. We complicate it, but it's very simple. It's all about falling deeply in love with Jesus. The Bible is a book of relationship, not religion, not rules. So many people have a distorted view of freedom and they think that the Christian life is all a boxed up kind of life of rules and regulations. It's because we have a distorted view of freedom. We think that freedom is uh, whatever I want to do, how I want to do. We're living in a culture right now that thinks that freedom is doing what I want, when I want, how I want, why I want. And have a look around you and ask yourself how that's working out for them. You are the freest you can be when you're in relationship with God free from all of your guilt, free from all of your shame, free from all of your sin, and free to love him. Jesus is talking with a, with a lawyer that was trying to trap him. Parable of the Good Samaritan, if you've read it. But before that parable, a lawyer says to him, how do you sum up the law? All these rules we've got, Jesus, all these regulations we've got, and Jesus says, well, how do you read it? Great question. And he says, well, I would sum it up this way. Love the Lord your God with all your mind, with all your strength, with all your power, and love your neighbor as yourself. He then went on to ask, who is my neighbor? He regretted asking that question. We complicate Christianity. We complicate 
evangelism. We, we think the answer for evangelism and reaching out to people, we think it's, it's, it's the next program, it's, it's dressing Jesus up, we've got to make... No, it's all about falling in love with Jesus. To live such a life that compels others, I want what you've got. I remember when I went to my foster mum's house, a beautiful lady, I was only there for a few days and I decided, you know what, I want what it is that you've got. It's time for us to live compelling lives. Let's finish off this parable. Jesus isn't finished yet. Verse 24, for I tell you, says Jesus, none of those men who were invited, remember the ones that kept making excuses? None of those who were invited shall taste my banquet. Man, I'm glad I didn't say that. God is not somebody to be trifled with. This is serious. The person who spoke the universe into existence is inviting and calling every one of us to come to his table. When I came to Brisbane, I had no idea of restaurants, cafes, or anything. I do now. And I went to cafes and I went to restaurants. You want to know why I went there? Because everybody else was raving about these cafes. You've got to try the food here. You've got to go to this cafe. I was compelled to drink coffee. I was compelled to drink good coffee. When you love Jesus, he'll be all you talk about. He'll be in every conversation. He'll be a part of all of your thoughts. He'll be the first thing you think about when you wake up in the morning. Many years ago, Jeanette was the first thing that Mark thought about when he woke up in the morning. He was the last thing that Jeanette thought about. He was the last thing Mark, she was the last thing that Mark thought about before he went to sleep. Oh, how times change. No. Let us fall in love with Jesus and live lives that compel others to come to the table. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you loved us first. That you were graceful to us first. You reached out to us first. You called us first. My prayer, Lord God, is that in this place you would be exalted above everything else in our lives. That means that you take the place of priority in our lives. Father, I pray that you would empty us of the things of this world, that we would fall in love with you. Forgive us, Father, for the excuses we make. Forgive us for the times we use the words if, gonna, and tomorrow. And I pray that today would be the day that each person, Lord, here, step further and closer and deeper with you. Father, we look to you in your glorious name.